Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. That said, if you're in the North Georgia area and you don't have a church you call home, we'd love to have you come and visit Brainerd, North Georgia. I'm praying that this message serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, encourages you, and even challenges you, all the while bringing you closer to Jesus. So again, super excited that you're checking out this video. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for church, and I think that the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. All right, you guys ready to dig in? All right, last sermon in the book of 1 Peter. And then next week, we got 2 Peter, of which I can't wait to start. So we'll see what that looks like at the end of the sermon. Uh, at the end of our service, I'll tell you more about that. But needless to say, as Art just read, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 11 this morning. There's a gentleman by the name of Josh, and uh, he serves as a pastor of counseling and congregational care at a church in South Carolina. And writing for Desiring God, he stated... We're asked common questions when people find out what we do. Are you a plumber? If you answer yes, get ready to remotely troubleshoot a leaky faucet. All right. Oh, you're a doctor. Well, you better get ready for a rundown of mysterious aches and pains. For counselors, somewhere near the top of the list is the question, what problems do you see most? Is it depression, anxiety, anger, or marital conflict? All of which make the cut. But Josh says, my top answer may actually surprise you. It's pride. Pride, being the chart topper, shouldn't come as a, as a surprise to anyone, and least of all, to Christians. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19 say, lists seven traits that God despises, and the very first being haughty eyes. And that's the proverbial way of talking about pride. Pride, he continues, is a prison that perpetuates anger, hurt, and foolishness while keeping at bay the restorative effects of conviction, humility, and reconciliation. Later, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, God tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Josh concludes and he says, not only can pride be your jailer, it can be your executioner. Pride is an insidious thing, is it not? Peter here, as he concludes this portion of his letter to these churches, finds a way to say, I need to address not only the pastors of which we covered last week, but now he says, I want to address, I want to encourage the church in a particular way. And what he begins to tell them is, listen to me, I want you to know that the last thing that you need in your life and in the life of the church is pride. That's the last thing that you need. In fact, what you need what we need is precisely what Peter's main point is, and that is we need to live with Christ-like humility until he returns. Rather than pride dominating the day within the church, rather than pride dominating the day within your own life, Peter says here what, what needs to win the day more than anything else is not pride but humility. I want you to have Christ 
like humility until he returns. And, and here's how he breaks apart this text. You want to know what Christ-like humility looks like? One, it looks like a humble attitude towards one another. And then secondly, it looks like a humble attitude towards God. Peter first begins with the body life, and then he moves in very personally to me and to you. All right? So strap on, okay? Because, yes, this this portion of Scripture addresses humility and pride, and he weaves this all together with how it relates to suffering and difficulty and pain within life. And so in moments and times through the sermon, yeah, it's hard. But that's because pride and humility is something that none of us can escape. It it invades all of our lives. All right, but let's begin with this very first truth that Peter brings up of what humility looks like, and that is a humble attitude towards one another. Listen to what Art just finished reading just moments ago. Verse 5 says this, In the same way, so again, that's the connection piece. So Peter's saying, I was talking to pastors, now I'm talking to the church. This is all linked together, okay? This all works together. So in the same way, or likewise is what your translation may say, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The main attitude here that Peter brings up is one of mutual submission. Mutual submission. Let me explain. On the one hand, Peter addresses the importance of submission within the church towards those who are in leadership and even to those who are older within the congregation. Okay? Now keep in mind, Peter just finished asking the pastors in the church to submit to what God had called them to do. What's that? To lead like Jesus and have the character of Jesus. In other words, to set the example not only as Jesus led, but how he lived. Okay? So, that's important to remember. Why? Because Peter isn't asking for a one-sided submission or deference towards those in leadership or those who are older but a demonstration of mutual submission towards one another. Pastors submit to God's command, and a congregation is to submit to those who are in leadership and those who are older. Who specifically is Peter asking to submit or give deference or respect to those who are older or in leadership? Well, he begins with the younger, and then he says, everyone, okay? Now, there's something to be said that Peter takes the time to acknowledge these two particular groups. Why? Well, for one, I remember these days. When I was younger, I thought I was the smartest thing on the planet, okay? And so I had a very hard time thinking that those who were older than me knew a little bit more than me, right? And then when I got older, I realized that those who walked a little bit longer on this life actually had some wisdom, Right? So, I mean, I've said this before, but there were times where before I got to college, I thought my dad was as dumb as rocks. And then I got to college, and I'm like, my dad's the smartest person on the face of the planet. Right? Because I realized I know nothing about this thing called life. (laughs) Right? Like at all. And so here, Peter's wise, and it's no surprise as it was then as it is true today of how important it is for those who are younger to recognize the wisdom that is in front of you and to submit to those who are in leadership or to those who are older than you, right? Now, what does submission look like in this text? It looks like trust, right? That is to have a bent towards trusting those who are in leadership to have an inclination to want to learn, to have an inclination to say, I'm ready to follow. Now, think of the context, okay? Don't divorce it from it, all right? This isn't blind trust. This doesn't mean that you don't actually ask questions, right? Or think carefully, or if there's something that's contrary to what the truth says, that you don't say, "Uh, there's something wrong with that. 
I mean, Peter just came off the heels, remember, I just said this, of saying that pastors or those who are older are worthy of trust if they live like Jesus and lead like Jesus. When that's not happening, there's cause to say, hey, what, what's going on here? And, and what a moment for the church and also for those, the responsibility that's incumbent even upon me, the weight that I feel knowing that, that right now, if, if you know this to be the case, you understand where I'm coming from, that institutions are really on rocky times because many do not trust institutions. But the church has an opportunity to demonstrate the power of the gospel and to show what it means to have a congregation to show to the world what beautiful mutual submission looks like so that it can be stated and it can be seen this is what this is what leadership and what congregational trust looks like and guys when you have that working within the church it is a beautiful beautiful thing why because there's always going to be events there's always going to be tasks. There's always going to be things that need to be done. And when we're willing to trust one another in things that we have to do, oh, man, things flow. And they worry. It doesn't mean you can't ask questions. It doesn't mean you can't inquire. All of that needs to happen. But at the baseline, Peter says here, listen, you need to, as younger ones, trust those who are in leadership. Now, he doesn't stop there. On the one hand, he talks to the younger, but then he also says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, right? We must remember that none of us, despite age, ever graduate from the school of humility. Right? Like, there's no ARP card for humility. It doesn't work that way. Right? <laughs> like, all of us in life will continually be learning what it means to be humble and humble towards one another. And again, I just mentioned it. You know how you know that? You know how you learn that? Do activities together. And you begin to see how important it is to have deference towards one another. And what I mean by that is respect, right? Why? Why should we do that? Well, Peter here adds a layer of motivation as to why we should live with this kind of attitude. And here's the motivation. It says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the who? To the humble. Peter says to this church, one of the quickest ways a church will experience a lack of grace from God is a church that is unwilling to respect one another, to give deference to those that are older and in leadership, and to love one another. I mean, think about this. Have you ever seen a church that has lost its direction or forgotten its purpose and its mission? Have you ever seen a church that seems devoid of the grace of God, the work of God within its walls? Have you ever seen relationships get ripped apart? Have you ever seen friends that have knocked down, drag out fights? Have you ever seen nations go to war? And oftentimes, where can you trace that back to? Pride is an insidious thing, and it could literally rip things apart. And so Peter says here from the get-go, listen, one of the sweetest things that you can find within a church is humility. Be humble towards one another. Now, Peter doesn't stop there. He says this is what a humble attitude looks like towards one another. But then he also says, I want you to have a humble attitude Towards God. So listen to me. If the same thing is true about God's grace towards a church that is willing to be humble before Him, then clearly Peter here is connecting the dots and saying the same is true then for your life personally. If you want to experience the grace of God, the direction of God, and even the provision of God within your life for getting answers and direction, that's what I mean by provision, then humility is the answer. And so here Peter says, let me give you three characteristics of what humility looks like in your own personal life. And then makes a case for why you shouldn't include pride within your life. All right? First and foremost, what does this humble attitude look like towards God? A humble attitude looks like one who trusts in God. 
One that has trust in God. Now, you may say, well, Paul, that's pretty simple. Yeah, but it's profound what Peter does here. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says the following. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Peter uses a phrase here, under the mighty hand of God. It's subtle what Peter does here, but that phrase is intended to make the reader look back at Israel during their time in Egypt when they too were suffering. The people of Israel learned what it meant to be under the mighty hand of God. They learned that it was God's mighty hand that one day would deliver them from the bondage of slavery and cruelty. Okay? Those believers in Peter's day, would have recognized that the same God who delivered Israel out of suffering would be the same one who would vindicate and deliver them out of their suffering. Now, some of that may have come by God's grace to some of those believers who were experiencing persecution and God was gracious enough to them to let them Uh, bypass that kind of persecution or alleviate whatever difficulty. But then others, God said, this is what I want you to walk through in this life. It will be hard. It will be difficult, but it will not be purposeless. You will not only learn of my ways, but you will learn of my presence even in the midst of difficulty and suffering, right? So here... Peter isn't just somehow or another running over pain and difficulty and pretending that God doesn't acknowledge it or that it doesn't exist. He acknowledges both, that God is gracious at times to alleviate things within our lives or God is good to provide his presence when things are hard. But one thing is the constant and one thing will remain true. Peter says when you peer into the future, one day we will see God's vindication of those who trust him and believe in him. That one day, because you believe now, you will see for all of eternity that God is good and that God will lavish eternal life upon you. And that, that's a good thing. It's worthy to say amen to. Why? Because that continues to give you hope. That continues to keep you moving forward, knowing that God is in fact in control. Right? And so... Follow with me. Because Peter provides them with this perspective from the past, right, then they at that moment could say, if God was in control through all of their suffering, if God was in control in the midst of his son's suffering, then certainly he is in control today, even in the midst of our suffering. Peter also then provides this glorious picture of the future of what I just mentioned. God will then exalt you at the proper time. In other words, what I just mentioned about eternity, that's what he means about exalting you at the proper time. If it doesn't happen now, know that in the future it's secure. So, listen to me, church. Difficulty and suffering for a believer may be limited, but vindication and exaltation is for eternity. Pride has an insidious way of telling you that God isn't in control. But when you trace all that he has done throughout the Old Testament, everything that he purposed in his son to be accomplished, then humility allows you to rest in knowing that he is in control. So a humble attitude looks like someone who is in fact trusting God. Secondly, a humble attitude doesn't carry, it casts. And you're like, what? A humble attitude doesn't carry, it casts. Let me show you what I mean. Look what verse 7 says. Casting all your cares upon him because he cares about You, your translation must say, casting all your anxiety upon him. Okay? Now follow me. The word cast is an interesting one. 
In fact, this word is used here in 1 Peter and also in Luke 19. Interestingly enough, it's, it's the only two times that you will ever find this word in the New Testament. This is the only times that you find it used. Which means that as you're a student of the Word of God, that helps you understand how Peter is using this word here in this particular book because you begin to realize, okay, there's a pattern here of what's being done when it comes to these particular words, okay? Now, in Luke, it's used when the disciples took their clothes and casted it onto the donkey that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem. You guys remember that? This means yes, that means no. <laughs> you guys with me? Just making sure we're all together. Okay, good. All right. So that's, that's that word cast used in Luke 19. What's the point? Well, think about it. When the disciples threw the clothes onto the donkey, whatever piece of clothing and its weight that they casted and put on the donkey, that weight shifted from their hands and onto the what? The donkey, right? Pretty, it makes sense. No longer were they carrying that weight. The donkey was now carrying that weight. Follow with me. Do you see what Peter is trying to say here, right? A humble attitude doesn't carry, it casts. Follow me, okay? Where do we cast this? To who? Do we cast this to God? Why? Well, exactly what the text says. Because he's God and he cares for you. So think about this. One, he is God enough to shoulder the anxiety and the desire to care for you when you are hurting I love this. God doesn't diminish the anxiety as if it's not real. The very fact that he says that he cares acknowledges that pain is real, that difficulty is hard, and that he acknowledges that anxiety and, and worry is a real thing in the lives of believers. And what's more is for some of us, we can become so anxious that it leads us to debilitating depression. It gets hard. And so what happens... You find yourself in a place where you feel like you are shouldering all of that weight. And then what's more is one of the most devastating things that can happen to you, though it's real and it's a struggle, is that you feel that you're the only one that is shouldering that kind of pain. And you feel alone. And God says, I don't want you to carry, I want you to cast. Why? Because I care for you. He tells you, I'm big enough to be able to shoulder what you're anxious about. And I am willing to come near to you when you need me the most. Paul, how does that relate to pride? Pride, pride mixed with anxiety tells you that you need to be the one who solves all of the problems. Pride mixed with anxiety tells you that you're the one who can shoulder the, situa the situation far much better than God can. Pride mixed with anxiety, tells you that you can't admit that you are weak, that you are vulnerable, and that you are desperately in need of God. Humility says, don't carry, cast. How do you do that? You run to God when you are weighed down with so much that is going on in your life. That doesn't mean that you somehow or another forget about what's happening or pretend that it doesn't exist. No, 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 no. This is something of an ongoing process for all of us that we constantly need to be aware of the fact that we need to make sure to go to the source from which we can draw strength, we can draw comfort, we can draw hope, we can draw our, our, our what we need the most, which is His presence within our lives when we're hurting. This is an on going thing for all of us to say, when worry, when anxiety rises, when different seasons of my life come through, I need to run to God when it's hard and when I am struggling with this. And think about it, guys. How often 
do we feel the sting when we've stepped out of the will of God and we decide to take matters into our own hands and try to figure it out in our own strength that all that that does is leave us in a place where we regret more than we wanted to when we realize what I needed to do first of all is to go to who? To go to God. To go to him. And so listen to me. If that's true, then again, verse 5 applies. God gives grace to the who? The humble. But he resists the proud, right? Have there been moments in your life when you're so anxious that you feel like you're directionless? Where you feel like you can't find an answer? Only to find out that at the root of it all has been that you've been trying to solve it on your own. Let me implore of you, believer, run to him. Go to him when you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders. And why do you do that? Because he cares. He cares deeply for you. So one, a humble, a humble attitude looks like someone who trusts in God. And then secondly, a humble attitude looks like someone who doesn't carry but casts. And then lastly, a humble attitude looks like someone who is vigilant. Okay, listen to what verse 8 says. Be sober-minded, be alert, all right? Two verbs that he says, do this, do this, okay? And he goes on to say, your adversary, so he gives you the why, the devil is, a, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Verse 9, remember, resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the entire world. Peter here uses two words that have a way of complementing one another. One speaks of someone who is composed, while the other speaks of one who is watchful, sober-minded, vigilant, okay, alert. Again, both are intended to complement one another and to be used together, and both are intended to help you and be valued. Now, I think all of us can understand this what it means to value being composed and being vigilant. If you don't believe me, get in the passenger seat of a brand new driver's, driver's license holder of a 16-year-old and on Monday morning during rush hour go on I-24 and see how important it will feel for you to compel them to remember that you need to have composure <laughs> and you need to be vigilant. Because right? <laughs> yeah, you're going to be like, if you don't, accidents everywhere, right? Death, like all this stuff, whatever. I'm exaggerating, but you, know, you get what I'm saying, right? There's a sense of urgency because you realize that at that moment, it's that important to remember. Peter says here, have that same kind of mentality knowing that you have an adversary that wants nothing more than to slander you and destroy you, all of you. And so he says, I want you to be vigilant and knowing who is your adversary. Now, this must have been a difficult portion of Scripture for Peter to write. Do you remember when Peter was sitting around the table at the Lord's Supper Right? One of the last moments that he had with Jesus. right, And then all of a sudden Jesus is commenting on different things, two of which were Judas and the other one was Peter as he's administering there for the very first time the new covenant. Right? And he's speaking about all of this. And then in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34, if you want to entertain that passage and turn there, you can. But if not, listen to what Jesus says to Peter, and, and why I believe this must have been quite the difficult thing for Peter to write, remembering what happened to him when Jesus was having a conversation with him at the Lord's Supper. Listen to these words. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, it's Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Okay? 
Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. I tell you, Peter, Jesus says, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times. In other words, the reason I believe that this may have been very difficult for Peter to write is because he remembered full well not to underestimate Satan. In short, how is this connected to pride and humility? Listen to me. One of the quickest ways you can be sure to fall is to think that you can overcome sin, Satan, and temptation in your own strength. You can't. A humble heart says, I need to be vigilant about my adversary. And then Peter gives a couple of other how-tos. Listen to what verse 9 says. He says, first and foremost, resist him. Don't entertain him. Don't try to think that you can go at it with Satan. You can't. Run. Resist him. Secondly, he says, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. So what does he do? He says, let me empathize with you for just a hot minute. And then secondly, I want to give you a quick how-to. You need to be firm in your faith. What does that mean? Do you know how they train? And I think some of you may know this or a lot of you. Do you know how they train people to spot counterfeit money? They don't show them a bunch of counterfeit dollars. What do they do? They train them to look at the real thing. So that when they spot a counterfeit, they go, ha, got it. Peter says, do you know how you can stand firm in your faith? You need to treasure and know the truth. Sound doctrine, knowing the Bible well is what's going to help you understand the tricks, the lies, and everything else that Satan throws at you. But when we do not treasure this, we leave ourselves vulnerable to thinking, hey, I got this. I know that I can resist him in my own strength. Pride tells you, I got this. Humility says, I need Jesus. Because if I don't, if I don't find myself in that place, I too, like Peter, will find myself in a place well, I will be sifted like wheat because I thought I could handle it on my own. You and I have the privilege, guys, of having this treasure trove of truth. Search it, read it, dig into it, apply it to your life. It's that important. And then lastly, he gives this massive picture of a motivation for all of us. He says in verse 10, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered for a little while. So he does two things. He says, hey, peer into the future. Brother and sister in Christ, know that whatever you may go through in this life may be temporary, but man, it's going to be good when we get to eternity. You and I will bask in his glory because you and I will see him for all that he is. And no longer will we have to deal with pain, with trouble, with heartache, and with sin. He will be good for all of eternity. And then he lands this portion of the text giving you and I a final word of what we should do. Listen to me, guys. Don't get it twisted. Humility isn't the ultimate goal here. Be humble, be humble, be humble, be humble, be humble, be humble, be humble. Don't do that. That's called moralism, where you try to become something that you're not. Humility is not the ultimate goal. Belief is. Belief, belief in what, Paul? Belief in the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ, and it's him, not you, that will restore, establish, and strengthen you. It's not you. It's him. It's you saying, I believe in who God is, and then therefore, 
I will see how humility flows out of my life. Not because of something that I did, but because of everything that I believe in him. Listen to me. Humility declares what a believer of Jesus believes about his God, about his protection, about his sovereignty, and about his grace during all walks of life. Pride in a believer's life will declare that God isn't enough and we need ourselves. Run from pride. What we need is not more pride, church. What we need is Christ-like humility until when, Paul, until he returns. So let me encourage you, believer, if you're struggling with pride, are you believing in the God who can sustain you? Are you believing in who you can cast all of your anxiety and your care upon? Do you believe him to be the God who is in fact in control? If not, can I submit to you, believer? Believe. Believe in the God who can help you, who can protect you, who can come alongside of you. Again, why? Because you don't need more pride in your life. What you need is Christ-like humility. That's what you need. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for you and incredibly thankful for your word. God, the more I look at this text, the more I realize how important it is to trust deeply upon who you are, to be vulnerable enough to admit that I don't have it all together, to be vulnerable enough to admit that I'm weak and that I need you. God, I pray that you would be near to those who are hurting be near to those who are weighed down with anxiety, be near those who are at the place where they feel alone and that they don't have anyone. Remind them of your good care and presence. God, help us to be a people who look to you and draw every bit of our strength, every bit of the grace that we need to walk this life. God, we love you, we're thankful for you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.